Hello and welcome back to 365 Days with MXM Tune. I'm Maya, a singer, songwriter, video maker, Oakland native, and a Nickelback fan. I'm also a huge fan of history. I love untold stories, gross facts, hidden secrets, and anything weird, dark, and funky from the past. Each day I'm going to share one of my favorite deep cuts with you, so let's take a look at today's story. It's 365 with MXM Tune. New facts every day, so don't leave too soon. I'm gonna teach you stuff, no, it won't be tough. Gonna go a year till you've had enough. It's 365. So, although I mentioned I'm a Nickelback fan, we'll be covering him in our music fact later on today, but for now, we're gonna talk about Singapore. Today, in 1965, Singapore gained independence from Malaysia and became its own country. Singapore is pretty small. It's about one-fourth the size of Rhode Island, which is the smallest state in the U.S., yet about six million people call the Southeast Asian country home. Rhode Island has one million residents, in case you're wondering. The story of Singaporean independence is a unique one. Usually we hear tales of fighting for freedom, but Singapore was actually just ejected from Malaysia. During World War II, Singapore was occupied by Japan, which was allied with Germany. Their reign was brutal, surveying civilians about their opinions about the Japanese. If they responded unfavorably, they would be executed. We don't know exactly how many people in Singapore and Malaysia were killed this way, but estimates say it's somewhere between 25,000 and 50,000. But once the war ended in 1945, the island's problems weren't over. Before the war, Singapore was colonized by the British, and now that the Japanese had surrendered, the British wanted their colonies back. In 1959, Singapore became an independent colony of the British Empire after the Labour Party pushed for the colony's self-governance. But the nation was struggling with high rates of unemployment and unrest. So by 1963, Singapore joined forces with Malaya, as it was known then, Borneo, and Brunei, to form Malaysia. Singaporean leaders wanted to join Malaysia because they thought that their island didn't have enough resources to support itself and that becoming part of a larger country would help them prosper. At the same time, though, Malaysia was having a political upheaval of its own. In the new country's constitution, Article 153 declared that indigenous Malays be safeguarded as natives of the land. There are quotas for Malay inclusion in civil service, public scholarships, and public education. This sounds great in theory. It's a way to prioritize the native people after over a century of colonialism. But due to the country's position as a seaport under British rule, many people from China came over as traitors. Race riots broke out due to the debate over Article 153, but Singapore's position within Malaysia was especially vulnerable, as the majority of the Chinese population was located there. So instead of confronting the complex racial issues between the indigenous people and a minority ethnic group who arrived as a byproduct of colonialism, Malaysia expelled Singapore from the nation. And to this day, Article 153 is still in action. Despite the country's challenges, the newly independent Singapore would begin to thrive. The country continued to profit off its useful location and global trade and combated homelessness by creating a robust public housing system. Just 9% of the population lived in public housing in the 60s, but now more than 80% of Singaporeans live in public housing. This gave individual families more stability in all aspects of their lives, reducing the need for frequent labor strikes. Compared to the U.S., where affordable public housing shelters less than 1% of the population, Singapore's housing programs might seem utopian. Since most of Singapore's infrastructure was established more recently than other countries, it has a reputation for being a tech-forward, ideal city. Yes, the Singapore public transit system is startlingly convenient, and yes, the Singapore airport really does have a gigantic waterfall in its center, but we can't erase the complex history behind this unique country's beginnings. On our August 7th episode, we talked about the movie Crazy Rich Asians. On one hand, it's a big deal that it's the first major Hollywood film to feature an all-Asian cast. On the other hand, it's a misrepresentation of Singapore to only focus on extremely wealthy Chinese Singaporeans. Sure, some people in Singapore really are crazy rich, but there's also rampant inequality in the small island nation, and the minority of Malaysian and Indian populations face discrimination. When people outside of Singapore see it merely as a crazy rich utopia, it erases the very real struggles that its population is still having over political rights, inequality, and freedom of speech. 
Singaporeans are subject to mass government surveillance. And while they have the right to political demonstration, there's only one public park in the country where they can assemble without a police permit. Well, now that we know a bit more about the history of Singapore, maybe we can remember it the next time we watch Crazy Rich Asians. And we can enjoy the couture outfits and outlandish decor, but we can also remember that this Hollywood film is nowhere near a complete picture of this country's complicated past and present. Now, let's talk about music. But more specifically, let's talk about Nickelback. On this day in 2005, Nickelback released Photograph, the first single from their album All the Right Reasons. Singer Chad Kroger wrote the song about his memories growing up in a small town in Alberta, Canada. It's based on a picture he took on a drunken night. I mean, the song speaks for itself. He looks at this photograph, and every time he does, it makes him laugh. Simple enough. It's hard to say why Nickelback became known as the world's most hated band, but there was a time in the internet where Nickelback memes were everywhere. But maybe it was because their music was everywhere too. This was before we all had aux cords and Spotify in our cars, and when you listened to the radio, you were almost certainly going to hear Nickelback songs like Rockstar and How You Remind Me. But, like most things, Trump made it even worse. On October in 2019, he tweeted an edit of the photograph music video in which Chad Kroger held up an image of Joe Biden and Hunter Biden golfing with a Ukrainian gas company executive. Soon after, the video was taken down for copyright infringement, but the completely bonkers tweet sparked renewed interest in the song. According to Billboard, it increased in downloads that week by 569%. Good for Nickelback, I guess? And now for today's final segment, I'll be going back into my own photo archives to see what I was up to on an August 9th in my life. On August 9th, 2018, I needed to go to the DMV, not because I was trying to get my license, but because I needed to get an actual ID that wasn't my school ID for the first time. And if you know me, I'm never going to learn how to drive. I have very little faith in my ability to drive a motor vehicle and survive at the end of it. Um, But yeah, it was, I, I hated it. I think most people hate their experiences at the DMV. I was not an anomaly from that. I hated my time at the DMV. I have my ID and it's the same one um, still to this day. I think it expires in two years or something like that. So then I have to go back at some point, but I'm not excited. Um, I think the next time I go back, I'll try to just make it a, a goal to get my license, but we'll see how that goes. You'll probably catch me tweeting about it. Thanks for going back in time with me and remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You can come back tomorrow for more stories from the past. It's 365 with MXM Tune. New facts every day, so don't leave too soon. I'm gonna teach you stuff, no, it won't be tough. Gonna go a year till you've had enough.